I got to was the it? office. Yeah. And they're like, all right, well, we're just having problems with Comcast. I'm like, man, <laughs> you folks invented the internet. You should have it all figured right. out. You are in a maze of twisty little passages all alike. Time to start a fire, crack open a can of tab, and settle in for Founder Quest. You just wait for someone to say something funny? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yep, we just got to wait. <laughs> we, and we, never, we don't start until someone says something funny. That's so much pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, re that, so, re um, that reminds me of the old Mitch Hedberg bit. Do you remember that bit? Right. Uh, no, I don't. He's like, my job is to sit around and and wait and think up things that are funny. But sometimes I'm too far away from a pen. And so then I just convinced myself that what I thought up wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch Hedberg's my spirit animal. I think he's better on audio, but yeah, just look up some of his old stuff. It's just some comedians, they'll get into a bit and, you know, the bit has stages and they'll sometimes hit like the same thing over and over again. And it'll be like 30 minutes, like Chris Rock, Barack Obama. <laughs> like he'll just keep saying the same thing over and over again. But yeah. Mitch Hedberg is like fastball after fastball. It's just all one liners. And it is. Yeah, he's so funny. <laughs> nice to check that out. We'll have to, we'll have to find some links for the show notes. Yeah, definitely yeah. checking out. And speaking of for our listeners, I was going to say, if, if you think that uh, Star sounds a lot like Justin Jackson today, <laughs> um, it's, it's because Star, unfortunately, couldn't make it. Her daughter's sick, and so she's home playing caretaker. But luckily, J uh, Justin was available, and so we're going to... I guess this is like the first guest episode of... Oh, is this Founder the first Quest, time ever? Guess, You're our first guest, Justin. You are the first oh, I, ever guest. I should have worn my um, Honey Badger shirt today. Totally. Yeah. I, I love see, that. Yeah. I love that shirt. I don't even know what I was thinking. I, I mean, you should, to be fair, you should always wear your Honey Badger shirt, <laughs> but especially on Founder Quest. We should send you six more so you can wear them every day of the week. Yeah, just so I wear them every single <laughs> right. day. I've got the, the yeah. uh, Godzilla one. Yeah. It's so good. Is there multiple yeah. shirts or is that, is that the only one you guys um, have right now? There's Armal. two. Yeah. Yeah, Godzilla is the latest, and then the other one was a uh, like a badger ripping ripping out of like the chest of the shirt, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and then we have a, we actually have a couple other designs that we should probably get going, uh, get to the printers. I think folks can learn a lot from you just in terms of swag. You definitely yeah. have the best swag. Like I think you set you set the high bar, uh, and everyone else is just trying to catch up to you. Well, thanks. Yes. We really, yeah, we love our swag, and yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's just yeah. it's so it's fun, yeah. And we like to have fun. I, my, my least favorite thing about going to conferences, I'm going to get in trouble for this. <laughs> my least favorite thing about going to conferences is somebody comes up to me with a shirt that they made for their startup. And they're like, hey, take a shirt. What size are you? And <laughs> I'm looking at the shirt. I'm going, I'm never going to wear that. It's just, <laughs> I'm never <laughs> going to wear it. Yeah. I'm not going to wear your sh shirt that's for, uh, uh, see, I can't even talk about it because some people will know. <laughs> <laughs> hypothetical, <laughs> hypothetical company incorporated. <laughs> they make for great it, painting shirts. It's, it's, it's almost like people forget, like they do all of this. Well, hopefully they do all of this thinking about building something people want with their software product. And then they make a shirt that just like they're, you know, their dumb logo or something with the dot com yeah. in it or the dot biz. And then it's an afterthought. And then I've got it. Although actually I will wear a dot biz shirt. If you have a dot biz domain, <laughs> I will wear that yeah. shirt. How about a dot well, you know, CA? We wear a dot our, CA shirt. Uh, I, will, <laughs> I will definitely wear a dot CA shirt. That's right. You just gotta, you gotta rep the, rep the CA. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. That's my, that's my yeah. other, I've had a few Americans go, what what the hell is this dot car? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm like it's Canadian. It's dot sa. <laughs> <laughs> dot sa. <laughs> That's good. Because the C yeah. in French well, is sa. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. God, if I, yes. I don't know. If I, I, have to I, I caught that. It's translated to English. I don't know. <laughs> I, we're 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 a little bit cultured here. <laughs> well, we are in the Pacific Northwest. We're close enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. I know you're a Laravel guy for the most part. 
But if you ever uh, want to explore the Rails world, uh, RailsConf will be here in Portland this year. So oh, sweet. You could always uh, come, come hang with some Rails people. Well, a transistor's built in Rails. So when I... Yeah, well, when, there you go. When I do hop in, <laughs> much to John's chagrin, <laughs> uh, it's always in Rails. Nice. The nice thing for someone like me is that once you understand... Because almost always all I'm doing is editing views. And so as long as you know where to find the views... You're fine. You, you can just, whether it's Laravel yeah. or Rails or anything that uses that MVC way of organizing things. It's, yeah, they all have similar architectures. Yeah. Yeah. I dig it. Yeah. We should totally go to Portland. That's, that's actually John and I's kind of, uh, that's our meeting point. So we've done, we've seen each other in Portland, I think almost every year since 2014. Nice. Yeah. And where where is John located again? He's in Chicago. You might have said he, he's in Chicago. Oh, that's right. I think I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. Which does work a little bit. I'm still trying to figure out because I live in a really small city. How big of a city do you need to live in? Like for us, it almost feels like we needed at least one founder to be in a big center. And I don't know exactly why I feel that way. There's just some serendipity of being in a big city. People are always flying in. No one ever flies into Vernon, British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless they're going skiing. When we started, you had been in Seattle the longest and, and you kind of had all the startup connections. Yeah. I, I recall. So yeah, yeah that yeah, definitely you helps. were kind of the, you were the city guy. <laughs> yeah. Even though I live, you know, on the yeah. east side of uh, the area. So I'm, you know, for Seattle people, I'm considered to be out in the boonies, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a grand total yeah. of 13 miles away well, from Kirkland. downtown. So yeah. <laughs> It's kind of funny how, how regional it gets, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I think it does help to have, you know, someone in one of those bigger centers because yeah, you're at the, the networking stuff that you're, if that's your bag, right. And you're, you're meeting those other entrepreneurs, you're having, you know, let's go to a coffee and talk about X, Y, or Z. I think that's much easier, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in a place like Seattle or Chicago or yeah. Yeah. I might move someday. But well, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah. If, if, if you move south, you come down here, you can still get the all dressed chips in the, in the grocery store. So you'll oh, be good. see, see, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now, okay. You're, 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 this is the sales process you need to, <laughs> you need to go through. Yeah. I don't know though. I mean, like, you got, you got transistor. It sounds like going pretty well now though. So maybe you won't have to move for a while because, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Run I, mean, it. I mean, yeah. So you're doing the sustainable, you know, it's just a sustainable long term growth thing. That's right. Yeah. So if anything, I think John, John would move to Canada. So <laughs> yeah. We, right. <laughs> we'd have to figure yeah. that out. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you don't need Chicago anymore now that you've, you've got it going. <laughs> yeah. We kind of, yeah, everything's going got now. A name. <laughs> yeah. We got to go somewhere else. Well, I'm, I'm super stoked that you're like the first guest on Founder Quest, considering that we uh, we're big fans of Transistor. And of course we use Transistor FM to host Founder Quest and have since the beginning so That's yeah fantastic. yeah you guys do it right everything about your show like that voiceover guy that you got <laughs> and the music and the artwork it's actually interesting that's in that's in your culture because i think i almost have a tendency sometimes to be like okay well let's just get this going and you know do it bare minimum mm -hmm. and it seems you have you folks have the opposite inclination which is no let's get some really nice artwork made because that's all custom Yep. drawn right yeah yeah the, the yeah we use it we have a the artist that you does our shirts we used for the founder quest yeah and uh, you did a bunch of customizations on your podcast website and <laughs> that voiceover guy like there's just it really does make a difference for a first impression and people yeah. always wonder how can they make their well they're always wondering how they how they can stand out with their podcast or their product or their blog or whatever and some of it is just like the noise is always kind of just thrown together. So, you know, there's a blog post that's just kind yeah. of thrown together or a podcast that's just kind of thrown together. But very few people just do the extra like steps of we're going to make the artwork look really great. And we're going to have, you know, this funny voiceover guy do our intros and outros. <laughs> it really does help. A good friend of ours, Alan Branch, back in the day gave us, um, I think it was actually Ben and I some advice. Um, on marketing specifically for us, because I was like asking him, like, you know, I, I wanted to learn marketing, but you know, we're really small and we're trying to stay small. And I was like, you know, how should we do this? And he's like, really, like, you're only the only thing you have going for you is like who you are, like your your personality and your brand. Basically, like that's that's your competitive advantage for the most part. Is like 
that's how you can really like stand out is like to be a unique, you know, individual com- company. Yeah. Um, so we've, that's why we've tried to like double down on that. Like the whole badger thing. Like we put that badger illustration everywhere. we try to do like interesting artwork, yes. uh, the interesting swag. And we didn't always do that. Like, like to be fair, our first shirt was like just a logo shirt on a Gildan. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the, the, it's like the shittiest shirt. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was, it's like a belly shirt on me because my shoulders are big and like, it doesn't fit at all. But it was orange. <laughs> it was orange. So we had but at, it least, was, at least that, but, right? <laughs> yes. It was bright orange and it worked in the beginning because it, even that stood out. Like, you know, everyone, no one like is walking around like a bright orange, like right. construction shirt. Exactly. So. That's the kind of risk taking I want to see from startups is somebody handing me a a midriff shirt (laughs) right (laughs) oh yeah yeah it stood out because of that too (laughs) yeah just saying yeah yeah. this is you gotta wear this i'd be like okay well (laughs) yeah i like it yeah that's definitely been intentional we've definitely uh tried to really enjoy if you pick a name like Honey Badger, you got just got to run with it, right? And that was the, that was the point that Alan made, and <laughs> uh, yeah, he helped us really, like, you know, liberate that in our in ourselves. And and the thing that's really yeah. cool that's been our experience is that it really resonates with the customers that we have and the customers that we want to have, right? Mm-hmm. If if someone doesn't really latch on to the whole Honey Badger idea, if they're you know repulsed by that or they find it you know unprofessional or whatever, it's like okay, well then you're probably not the best customer for us. Right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But wait a second. How many customer service messages are you getting that say, I'm repulsed by this? Last <laughs> <laughs> mm, count, I think it was zero. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should, we should have like a survey or something in app. Like, are you repulsed by this? <laughs> and, um, or we, we, you know, we got the right message uh, thing on the website. We could, we could make that a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think most people would say that's the wrong customer you know right, right, right. yeah exactly. but we do have a lot of people saying exactly. like i really it really resonated with me i really like what you guys are doing i want to support you and that's been a lot of fun especially for i'm imagining yeah. that a lot of your a lot of folks are like the purchase cycle starts with a developer who's right. saying i'm i want yeah. to use this right they're advocating yep. for you so I think having some fun in your messaging makes sense because that's what's going to stand out for a developer who's, you know, working on stuff. You're going to, there's a yeah. lot of boring companies out there. So if you're interesting at all, maybe they'll advocate exactly, for yeah. you. Yeah. We've specifically chosen to like, like we own, like we, that really is like a developer is our, is the person we're always talking to versus, and that's something that does set us apart from our competitors because they're very into the enterprise, you know, they have a lot of VC funding and they've got enterprise salespeople and that's where all the money, their money is, you know, that's what they're going after. So yeah. they're not, they don't have the ability to speak to developers quite like we do. Yeah. yeah. I've got questions about that, but I don't, do you, do you have specific yeah, so, things you want to talk about? Cause I well, don't want to, I don't want to like, yeah, think so no, <laughs> this is great. This is really great because I think this actually ties into kind of like why I actually ask you to come talk to us today. I think the name of the episode on Build Your SaaS was uh, Should You Build an Audience First? But it was like you had an interview with... What was the other name of the podcast that you were interviewed on? I'm blanking on it right now, but... Should You Build an Audience um, First? Um, oh, this it was, was basically... On, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was on the Product Journey podcast. Yeah. The Product Journey. Yeah. And so I, was a, I caught that episode and um, it, was, uh, it was really interesting to me. I know you've talked a lot about the whole... The myth of the niche mm-hmm. market... Um, a lot. And uh, I think I've missed some of that conversation. Forgive me if, if like we're rehashing like old, uh, old, like, you know, Twitter debates or something. Yeah. But I thought that was really interesting. And um, I, especially considering with Honey Badger, you know, we kind of like chose a niche early on, which was uh, within, uh, obviously within web developers, we launched only for Rails. I think that there's some nuance there. Um, I know that your, your position is kind of like that it can be bad. Ad- you think it could be bad advice potentially to like choose a niche um, when you're just starting out. Yeah. And, um, and I think there's probably some nuance in there, but I just thought we could maybe get into that a little bit and kind of hash it out. Yeah. I mean, my favorite topic, people, <laughs> people getting sick of it. But I mean, I think first of all, the challenge with saying anything in public or even just trying to figure things out in public is that People might take my line of thinking from three months ago and then hold on to that forever. And I've, I've tried to say this over and over again on Twitter, especially 
I treat Twitter like a comedian treats, you know, testing <laughs> out material at a local club. I'm just going there and uh-huh. I'm testing things out. And definitely some of what I want is people to respond back with challenges to those thoughts. And it's like now there's almost this expectation that every thought you ever express publicly has to be fully formed and rock solid. And there can, you know, you have to be willing to defend it till the day you die. And it's maddening to me. (laughs) The flip side is something that annoys me even more, which is I'll I'll have thought about this and hashed it out in public forever. And then I'll do this well-researched article that took me weeks to think about and years to like process. And I'll finally put it all down on paper and it's sourced. And then (laughs) somebody will just say, well, that's dumb or that's wrong. Like, (laughs) okay, well, at least give me, at least give me something like write a fully formed peace in rebuttal instead of just saying, well, that's dumb or you're just after (laughs) attention or something like it's right. It's silly. So that's super frustrating. I think there is nuance to this. And part of it is semantics. Like what do you consider to be a niche? And I'll tell you what I've seen happen that I think people should be wary of, which is for them, a niche means a small, tiny little group of people where there isn't a lot of other competitors. So they'll say, well, no one is competing in this, in this little market here. And so that must mean it's a good thing to go after because I have no competition. Even Kevin Kelly's idea of a thousand true fans to me, like when you really think about it, because his, his line of reasoning in that blog post, if you haven't read it, it's a famous kind of internet essay is that there are billions of people on the planet and therefore any kind of category or interest group you can think of, you can find a thousand true fans, which he defines as a thousand people who could support the work you do financially. To me, that's just a a silly line of thinking. One, because what kind of math are we using here? Are we using every man, woman, and child on the planet? That cuts down your billions, right? And then are these interest groups irrespective of country and culture and economic situation. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of ways you can slice this. In practice, sorry, I'll just go to the side here. There's also a famous John Gruber and Merlin Mann talk at South by Southwest where they say, don't create a site about Star Wars, create a site about that one Jawa in that one scene. To which I've always gone like... (laughs) Are you crazy? <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody cares about that one Jawa. Sure, create a site about that, but there's not, it's not like there's <laughs> all this pent up demand for that one scene with that one Jawa. That's just ridiculous. Well, a few people care about it, maybe, and you might have a lot in common with them, <laughs> but are they, are they going to like, you know, keep you afloat for? <laughs> That's right. Are they going to support a business? Right? And this is the yeah. challenge is that. <laughs> Obviously, there's multiple vectors to this, and this is just kind of ground zero, which is, are you focused on a group of people where there's enough of them, enough purchase frequency, enough purchase price, and enough actual activity going on in this market that you think you could have a business? And the... I think one thing, one realization I've had lately that gets kind of, kind of messes up this conversation about niche is people will say, well, we focused on Ruby on Rails developers and that's a niche. And so, you know, therefore, yeah. one thing I've realized as, I, as I've thought about this a lot is that web developers or even just programmers in general is the most uncharacteristic market there is in the world. There's no, no other market <laughs> like developers. And I mean this in a good way, in that people, the joke used to be that programmers don't pay for things. That is such bullshit. Programmers are some of the most highly people, highly paid people on the planet. They are always buying new tools. They are always paying for their education. They are highly incentivized to be better at what they do. All of their political capital in an organization is about what they suggest. Programmers, as an example of you know, how niche markets can work, I think is uncharacteristic. Like you're not going to get that same benefit with shepherds. There's no market like programmers. It's just very uncharacteristic right now. By the way, if artificial intelligence really does take over 
let's say in 25 years, takes over most programming, that will become a bad market because th- there will be way less people who are, it's just like mm-hmm. we've seen these waves before, right? I think like programmers, they, they'll know, they won't pay for dumb things usually. Mm-hmm. Like, but when it comes to something, at least me personally, like if it comes to something that will demonstratively you know, like increase my productivity or my ability to do what I do better, like I will buy it in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. It's a no brainer to me. Maybe that's part of like, you know, developers are always optimizing, looking for opportunities to optimize in the first place, but I don't know. Yeah. And, and there's some things that programmers, like any group, won't pay for. Yeah. Certainly, like you could do far worse than choosing a technical audience for your product or service or educational product or whatever. It's a good market. Yeah. And so I think some of the, the challenges especially for new entrepreneurs, as we set up these examples of like, well, Adam Wathen released this course and did amazing with it. And so you can take this to any group in the world and have similar yeah. results because Adam chose a niche of Laravel developers that care about test-driven development. You have to take every characteristic of that market. You can't just, you can't just say, well, it's the fact that it, yeah. it is somewhat that you're you're positioning it for this like kind of yeah like the contours I mean, to be fair yeah like most laravels or laravel developers care about test driven development to to some extent like right like it's not there's not ever like i there, i assume there's not a huge group of laravel developers that just despise test driven development and would never buy a course about test driven development yes but it, i think the the counterpoint yeah. is that in other adjacent groups there may be something similar where people care about it, but are don't have the same incentives to pay for it. Like going back to my shepherd example, this is going to get bad, but <laughs> just like, you know, maybe there's a, a, a proper way to shear your sheep or the, I don't know, but they might not have the same incentives or the same ability to pay or the same economics yeah. that rule their lives. And so there is tons of nuance to this, but in the, in the original post that I posted, it was kind of attacking this idea that because the internet is huge and there are billions of people, any niche will do. It's like, that's not, that's not good advice. And even like there's these truisms that get thrown around that I, I just do not find helpful at all. Like the riches is in the niches. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I hadn't heard that one, but that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I think some of the nuance there is maybe some confusion about, you know, making your product versus marketing your product. If you make your product that only shepherds can use it, let's just, let's just roll those shepherds. Yeah. You know, <laughs> obviously that's a very limited market, right? But if you made a product, yeah. let's say like scissors, you know, or, mm-hmm. or shears, right? Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, right. shepherds could use these shears as well as I mean, maybe, maybe camel herders as well, right? Mm-hmm. So right. maybe your initial marketing is just those shepherds with the idea that I'm going to make some noise in this smaller group. Like, you know, Seth will tell us, like, market to people who, you know, like yeah. us who do things like this. Right? Mm-hmm. You get that small audience where you can actually make some noise and then you can take it to the next adjacent audience and the next one. Right. So yeah. even though, you know, even though our marketing yeah. for Honey Badger started out with the Rails people and we we tailor the product very much for Rails people in the early days, it wasn't like it was only applicable to Rails developers, right? Any web developer, any software developer, which is a very big market, could use it, right? So mm-hmm. there's a difference between building your product for a very small group of people and depending on that yeah. 1,000 life fans versus just marketing to that group initially, right? This was like my secret agenda all along was, was like part of the new, the nuance, I think, in this discussion might be like positioning versus versus actual like market. I don't know. I feel like that can get like kind of confusing a little bit yeah, like shepherds is a defined, like there's only like X number of shepherds, right? Yeah. Like, but there's like tons of people who use, who use scissors. And I, again, I could be wrong. I'm just some idiot on the internet. What, what do I know? But in my experience, so much of a business's success actually gets decided in the first 1% of the company, which is when you decide who is this for and what is this for? And in my early 20s, I started a skateboard and snowboard shop. And immediately, I am now in the skateboard and snowboard market. And there are characteristics about that market that define and cap 
how well you're going to do. It defines your margins. It defines your customers. It defines who your competitors are. It defines everything. It defines, you know, how you are going to ride the waves of the economy. You know, and I've got my degree in business. Like these are things that never got taught to me. And I still think these are things that people just brush over, which is, you know, I'm going to choose this group because I like them, or I'm going to choose this group because of whatever metric we use. And to me, I say, you should choose that group because there is evidence that there's a lot of economic activity going on in there. And you feel like you feel reasonably confident that you could capture some of that economic activity. And that really is the, that's the process you have to think about. That 1% or 10% is going to define everything else that comes after that. It's kind of like you mentioned positioning. I think it's kind of like skiing, right? So if you are on a flat slope, you can position your skis however you want. You can point them right. You can point them left. You can do a pizza. You know, you can do whatever you want. You can go backwards. You're not going to move because you're flat. If you have a steep slope, you're going to move a lot faster. And then positioning matters quite a bit because that's how you're attacking the slope. And I think business is like that. Now, I'm kind of glad that I don't have a, a slope as steep as Peldy did when he started Balsamic because that sounded like crazy, too much slope, too steep, going too fast. But I could say transistor slope is a lot better than things I've tried in the past. And wow, do things get easier. If you've ever taught somebody how to ski, like if they're going too slow, it's actually harder. You need some sort of slope there to even be like, okay, well now you're going to like lean this way. So you can gradually get into it. Yeah. And as you learn. Yeah. And I just feel like not enough people are talking about that. Like what slope are you choosing? And if, is there any, evidence that there is a slope there that you could actually ride down. Because all of the stuff we add later, yeah. which is like positioning, which is like tools, like that's like your ski gear mm-hmm. and all that other stuff. All of that sure. matters, but it only matters once you're moving. <laughs> and in the beginning, it seems like the, the most important decision you make is what market am I going to target? Yeah, right. I think that's I think that's excellent. I 100% agree. I have a friend of mine who, as an entrepreneur, whenever he's looking for ideas, he's always looking for, is there a marketplace where people are spending money on this thing already? Mm-hmm. If there isn't, then I'm not interested because I don't have the resources to make a market. Yes. Yeah. But, right. but I do have the resources to carve out a segment of an existing market. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And even, I mean, I'm, I'm just digging into this. There's probably smarter people than me that are know about this, but I'm really interested in how markets get created because so far I've just focused on, you know, is the slope there or is it not? There's this also interesting thing of like, what creates those slopes in the first place? And, or I've, I've used the surfing analogy as well. We can't just be winter specific here. You know, <laughs> what, what creates those waves that you can then paddle out to and then try to sure. ride? I think from what I can tell, as I investigate the big waves, like uh, the internet, automobiles, uh, things that people often bring up to me when they're like, yeah, but what about the light bulb? Uh, <laughs> a lot of those things are actually the result of government and academic investment. So like Mm -hmm. the internet is nothing without the U.S. military and is nothing without Mm -hmm. millions and maybe billions of dollars in research grants. The internet is a huge wave, but it wasn't an entrepreneur that created that wave. Henry Ford did not create the automobile wave. What created the automobile wave is a bunch of things, but maybe the U.S. Highway, Interstate Highway Act, where they, the government funded 90% of the cost of construction had something Mm -hmm. to do with Henry Ford having this big wave to ride. Right. And I think there's this, uh, this capitalist like idea that it's like, no, it's us entrepreneurs that are creating all entrepreneurs. I do not, I don't think entrepreneurs in most cases create the demand. Mm -hmm. I think we find demand. You're saying we're kind of riding larger economic trends. That's right. I think the waves get, the waves get created by things bigger than us. 
and maybe once you get to scale, maybe, you know, at Apple scale or Amazon scale. But mm-hmm. that's my other point is like, we are, we're not even close to that. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. Like the, like how different things are for, you know, small business. Like we're small businesses. Yes. Basically. And, you know? and the, I mean, and the I, difference between like a, a <laughs> business at our size. And so, yeah. so like, Amazon's revenue was 70 billion in 2019. So I'm just going to put, I think Transistor's annual revenue right now is around 500,000. So what is it? Mm-hmm. What's 500,000 divided by a billion? Yeah, it's like our annual revenue is Amazon's toilet paper budget. For yes. The year. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and I actually had, that. I had, I had that <laughs> thought. I visited the Spotify headquarters in New York. And I was like waiting. First of all, that's a crazy, like they have a security desk downstairs. And I'm just like this, <laughs> I'm just this like a Canadian from the sticks. And I'm like, what the hell? And go up this <laughs> elevator. And then there's another waiting room where you sign in and wait for the people you're going to talk to. And it has a coffee bar and it overlooks the New York Harbor. My eyes are just like, what the heck? And then I went to the bathroom. And they have all mm-hmm. these bathrooms and they have all of these like, you know, startup amenities, like mouthwash and everything. And I was looking around and thinking, how much does it cost to stock these bathrooms every month? It's probably just as much as Transistor was making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, it, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, so the, the point being, oh my God, I just did 500,000. <laughs> no, so, oh wait, I want 70 billion divided by 500,000, right? Is that what I want? Yeah, divided by fi- yeah, 500,000. Amazon's annual revenue is 140,000 times our annual revenue. The scale of these companies is crazy. And so the idea that us Mm -hmm. little bootstrappers would take any advice from Jeff Bezos. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, why are you even, don't read his book. Don't ever quote him. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> why are why are we quoting Steve? I quote Steve Jobs all the time, but like Steve Jobs, it was a, he was on a different he's in a different universe. He's not even on the yeah. same planet. So yeah, I and I, I mean, there are people who start businesses that aspire to to that that are like trying to build the next Amazon. But then there's people. I don't think that's you know we are not trying to build the next the next Amazon. Yeah, and uh, you know. and a lot of us in the bootstrapping world are not. And again, I I'm not I'm still not convinced as far as I can tell. Those companies are still riding waves at their scale as well. Right. Maybe they can create some demand, but even the iPhone, which people always hold up as like this super, you know, this big innovation. I mean, there was lots of things in the long line leading up to the iPhone. There are many things. Mm -hmm. And there's also this idea that we're always building on top of something else that you can't just build demand off of nothing. Like a lot of the demand for the things, the the problems that the iPhone eventually solved, like were like weren't possible until the iPhone existed too, right? Like it it ended up doing a lot of things that they didn't even foresee when they created it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of that just happens kind of as things get into motion, right? But I mean, I had apps on my Palm Pilot, right? I had I had a word processor that I could download off of App Store on my Palm Pilot uh, when I was going to college in the early two thousands. So these ideas were already in motion and there's just, you know, they build on that momentum and it just keeps going. Yeah. And I guess now the challenge for Honey Badger and for Transistor is I also have this theory that there are natural limits to every market, meaning there are walls or contours. And so you kind of grow to whatever the limits of the market are, and then you stop, and then you grow slowly. Yeah. yeah have you guys experienced that as well? Yeah, yep. we've, we've, yep. we have, yeah. I was going to ask, um, and this probably is a, is a lead into that. You talk about the slope, and you're, you might be going in like a kind of a, a direction, skiing down this slope, but you have the ability to change, change directions. For us, like we started out, we only supported Rails, and Rails developers were our market, but we eventually did reach limits to that where we weren't growing as fast as we wanted to grow. And we had to go and look for like, how do we broaden the market that we can serve, mm-hmm. basically. And because our broader market was still web developers and we do something that is general, it's still general to all of them, we could go add support for Laravel or go into like numerous markets that existed within this large market. 
that were all open to us. Mm -hmm. I want to say like, I still like the niche advice holds up is that like early on, I think it was a good, it was a good idea for us to, to launch for rails developers. We, it was who we are. We know them intrinsically. They have, you know, there are, there's nuance in every development community. So you can't sell the same thing in the same way to everyone. And like you said, we probably didn't even have the ability to, to like launch something that is going to like appeal to every single type of developer out there. And I don't even know if that's even possible. Like even now, like yeah. there's always going to be, <laughs> there's going to be the gr- development group that just doesn't get it. Yes. And, um, and so I agree with you, by the way, I, I like Tyler Tringus's, his definition of <laughs> niche uh, after we've argued about this a lot. He says uh, when he uses the word niche, he uses it in the ecological sense, meaning roughly sufficiently specialized to the point of acquiring mm-hmm. a comparative advantage rather than simply meaning small. And nice. Okay. Yeah. I, I think there's something about that that can be helpful. Again, we got to be careful because it really depends on what you're trying to do. In some cases, maybe you do get started better if you focus on this specialized group and it gives you a comparative yeah. advantage. For Transistor, the opposite happened is we started saying, okay, we got to specialize. We got to say, this is who this is for. And I was getting tons of DMs from paying customers that say, by the way, that messaging on your homepage where you say you're just for businesses kind of threw me off. Like I almost didn't sign up. And now that we've, we have about 2000 customers, I can see, okay, wow, we were really off. (laughs) This is, yes, we have businesses, but really, Transistor is much more aligned around the job to be done, which is, I just want somewhere to host my podcast, right? Podcast hosting. That's what I'm searching, right? Yeah. It's not, I'm not searching podcast hosting for, and this is another, I think, nuance about the software development market is that, yeah, often you are looking for error test, error monitoring for Rails apps, right? But there are some markets where you're just looking for engagement rings, right? That's all I care about. I don't want engagement rings for Canadians. I don't want engagement rings for people who are five foot eight. I don't want like, I'm just looking for engagement rings. And I'm sure there's exceptions to that. But I'm just saying in the mass, if you really want to target the market, sometimes adding on this qualifier can be a disadvantage. But yeah, I, yeah. I do think that for some products, or maybe even all products, I don't know, this is where you have to know the group you're starting, the group you're targeting. Sometimes there's an advantage to really narrowing your focus and saying, this is the specialized group of people like us that we're going to focus on. But there are yeah. other advantages too. Like it's not like that's the only one that exists. There's so many different vectors to business. And yeah. yeah well, that's the thing. Like I, we did it like we did this one, like, we only did this one way. So we only have experience of, of like how it worked out for us. Like mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not like married to this idea at all. Like I, I don't know what it, wh- what it would have been like if we had like targeted the entire market and still, you know, awesome. been appealing to rails developers, but yeah, just I cause think, I don't I have think, that experience. I think too, you have to consider the, the maturity of the market, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if you, if you launched a, uh, an HR tool today, you know, tool for recruiters, mm-hmm. right? There are how, you know, gazillions of recruiting tools out there right now, mm-hmm. right? It's going to be hard to grab a significant portion of that market without doing something pretty remarkable. But if you're launching a, you know, a podcast hosting platform in 2019, when podcasting is on the rise in a big way mm-hmm. and the market is relatively new, yeah. Right. It's, it's easier to capture a broader segment of that market, uh, with a broad message, right? You don't have to say it's just for shepherds, right? Yeah. You can say it's for everyone podcasting, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's growing so quickly. So yeah. I think that's, that's definitely a consideration as well. Yeah. And also remember some of those big mature markets, they, every, all markets go in cycles. And so some of those big mature competitive markets, all of the players are super old and crusty. And all it takes is a newcomer to come in. I mean, look at superhuman. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that is ridiculous that someone comes in with a new email client in, you know, in 2018 or whatever, whenever they came out, you can stand out in some of those markets. And the common advice is like, Oh no, don't, don't go to those markets. Microsoft's got it all wrapped up. Yeah. Where if you, maybe you shouldn't like, for example, I, I think project management, that market is very difficult right now. Lots of 
big players uh, who are quite entrenched. The market itself is difficult. You have to convince a yeah. whole team to buy as opposed to just one person. And, and like ev- literally everyone's building one too. Like I, I've built a project management <laughs> yes. system and I, most of my friends have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're very opinionated people. They're all different. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you've got to do some research. You've got to, I've had some podcasts where people are like, well, give me an example of another good market you should pursue. And I said, well, <laughs> it's not that easy. If it was easy, I would just be, you know, betting on the stock market all the time. Like it's, it's <laughs> difficult. And so much of it has to do with the, the entire, your entire journey. What brought you he- here today and what position you are yeah. and what you can see from your vantage point. And so, you know, I've been podcasting since 2012 and I could see kind of a lot of things that a lot of other people maybe couldn't see. And that helped, right? There's other things that happened there too. I built up a bunch of connections. There's a bunch of people who knew me. There's a bunch of people who I knew. There's all of these kind of characteristics that you bring to the slope, right? And maybe I was geared up better than some other folks because that's the other kind of pushback I get is, well, it can't just be the market. Obviously, something else, there's other things that matter. I'm like, of course, but let's, let's build a foundation here. Okay. First you choose the slope. Okay. And then you show up in jeans and a t-shirt. I'm like, okay, that's not going to work here. You're going to need a ski outfit. Okay. Go back and get a ski outfit. And then you come back yeah. and you've got little uh, snow blades. And I'm like, no, that's not going to work either. We're skiing powder today. <laughs> you get to go, you know, go back again. And if you've been skiing since you were three, and you show up that day and it's a super steep slope and someone else shows up and they've only been skiing for two days. Yeah. You're going to kick their ass. That is how it works. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's how business works. And so, yes, the slope matters. But after that, it, there's like, there's also this, like, we're not all going to make it. So, yeah. So I've, I was going to say, I've always had this sneaking suspicion that we were just like super lucky with honey badger like like that maybe that's the reason <laughs> that we're here mm-hmm. well, is that we just like happened to do this at the at the right time and there are people there's demand there's definitely a right place right time aspect there's no question yeah. that that luck plays a part but i think the preparation is also there right like we had been rails developers yeah. for like you know nearly 10 years at that point right we we saw a lot of those things like like justin was talking about and i think that's definitely a factor that should go into a selection for what you want to work on, right? Like, what am I prepared to do? And, and oh, by the way, I'm not going to hobble myself by picking a market that's too small to actually make an impact in, in my life, in my life as right. I'm trying to make a business that supports me. Yeah. Actually. And what am, yeah. what, what am I prepared to do? And what have I been preparing for? I think are the two things you want to think about. When we started, when we started Honey Badger, um, you know, everyone was like mad at air break for not working right and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, there were like most of our customers were developers who were frustrated with airbrake which is what we were but they didn't go out and start an air tracking service yeah like even though a, a lot of them were uh, you know in the same position as we are we were or had all the same foundation maybe even had better network you know i'm sh- i'm sure there we had an initial customer that had a better network and you know twitter following and everything than we did at the time yeah but we were the ones who went out and did it. And so now we're the ones who have a business exactly <laughs> today because the demand existed. Well, just, just picture in your mind, all those surfers out there in the ocean, just waiting for waves. And it's a big group. There's hundreds of them. And every right. uh, once in a while, a wave will come along and the surfer has to make a decision. Am I going to go after that wave? And sometimes you choose the right wave and sometimes you choose the wrong wave. Sometimes you choose the right wave, but there's so many other people going for that wave. It doesn't work out, right? They, they kick you off your board yeah. or whatever. Or sometimes you just do everything right and you still just slip. There's all sorts of potential there. And I mean, even sometimes, sometimes you can r- ride, but see, it's hard to ride a, a bad wave. That's the thing. But <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. Can have a bunch of people sitting around looking for waves to ride and they miss a good one. That happens all the time. Yeah. If you pick too small a wave of a wave, then you're not going to have much fun. That's right. 
That's yeah. right. That that's that's where that's that's where the <laughs> metaphor works. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're uh, have we run this metaphor into the ground yet, or I guess into the shore. <laughs> we gotta get we gotta get some shepherds on the boards. <laughs> or get some familiar. shepherds on the boards. Um, maybe uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe we could talk about a swimming pool next time. <laughs> I, I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up though, because every time I have this discussion, my thinking gets moved forward a bit, and I get nudged forward. And yeah. the whole reason I talk about it is because if we're gonna even have podcasts like founder quest or build your SaaS, or we're going to have conferences like microconf like if we're going to be discussing this the whole idea is we're trying to help people not make mistakes right that's that's like sure that's robin mike's intro right so you don't make the same mistakes <laughs> we did and this advice is mostly for folks who are starting something new but still applies to us again like if you're if we go back to the skiing metaphor you know, there's this run at our mountain here where you're going down this slope and then it splits. You can either go down this like black diamond or double black diamond. And depending on the conditions that day, you have a choice. Am I going to go that way or that way? You can also like, I've gotten myself into places where it's like super flat and I have to dig myself out and it takes forever. You know, mm -hmm. even once you're going, there's these decisions. And I feel like that's where I need help these days is, is figuring out you know, okay, things are starting to slow down. What do we do now? Or there, there's still things that can happen while you're in motion and that are market related that are just like, you know, I mean, that's what I think about all the time is maybe, yeah. maybe podcasting is just here for a couple of years <laughs> and then it's going to be gone. And you know, what do we do then? So yeah, that, yeah we think about that too. That's the part. Well, well, well that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, not not podcasting, not podcasting, <laughs> but you know, Even like it's, uh, we have the we have the fear. We you know, is this is this uh you know, is it gonna is it just a passing thing or yeah? You know, we're still kind of like pinching ourselves a little bit. I think you've maybe used that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is we, it real? We, we share your <laughs> your feeling. We still like wake up. Is it gonna be all be on tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's been eight years. <laughs> <laughs> eight years of that anxiety. That's, a, that's the other thing is like, it gets, it gets a little better. I mean, like to, to be fair, yeah, it gets a little better to give you some hope. <laughs> yeah. I guess once you have, that's the other challenge at the beginning. You get used to it. Is that once you have more years of data, then you can at least like most things don't drop off suddenly. Most things have a gradual slope up or gradual slope down or an up and down or whatever. And yeah, we just don't have yeah. enough data right now to, to know, right? We've got, two years of data. And I think I'll feel better when I get to year three or four or five or whatever. But mm -hmm. I, I can see that the, what do you call that temptation to sell? Because we, we actually had an offer just a couple of weeks ago. And we're still, like I said, we're, we're over 500k in ARR. But if you think of the multiples of that, they're not great, right? Like if you, yeah. if you get, but that's in two years, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. but if you get, you know, so if you get a three times multiple, you get, you can do the math, right? And that's, yeah. we, that would be split between two people. So like 1.5 million split between two people is not a great payout, but you can see why people sell because there's always this nagging thought of, you know, mm -hmm. do I, it's very much like poker. Like, do I, exactly. do, do, do I like, do I let it ride? Do I let it ride or? Yeah. Yeah. And when do I cash out my chips? Like I got to, we've all been in those games where you cashed out too late. And I mean, I think we're still too early to sell, but I can understand. Yeah. I, I, I used to like kind of judge people that sold, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like with a, yeah. with a 37 yeah. signals, uh, piousness, like, oh, mm -hmm. good you know, way to go. But I, yeah. I totally get it. I totally get. Yeah, it. we've had that had the conversation a few times, and uh, yeah. yeah, the first time, the first opportunity, we felt the same way. It was just too early. Like we 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 felt like we haven't we haven't uh, shown yet whether or not we can actually do this, and we want to find out if we can do this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so yeah. so later opportunities came along, and it was like okay, the payout isn't exactly what we would like. You know, the the revenue the, doesn't get us a multiple that we can just sail off into the sunset forever. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. 
this could all disappear tomorrow. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and by now we're pretty, we're pretty like, we have a pretty good idea of like what it will take to get it to the next level mm -hmm. too. Whereas before I, we didn't know yeah. half as what well, as much as we know now. I mean, so. from my perspective, from an outside perspective, like podcasting definitely feels like, feels like a more fragile market because the medium is always changing. And a lot of our customers are aspirational. Like they aspirationally want to have a podcast. And as you, as you folks know, it's hard recording something that's good every week. Error tracking yeah. and error monitoring that to me, that just seems like that's only got to increase, right? Like, the, uh -huh. like <laughs> as the number of programs in the world. Yes. And actually, this is a way I like to think about it is <laughs> how many people are going to be lined up tomorrow? waiting for the Honey Badger store to open up so that they can buy air tracking. And mm -hmm. in, my, in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, there's going to be, of course, there's, tomorrow, there's going to be some boss that says, hey, we got to get some air tracking. And we want something that works with Slack. And so they just like, da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. they're lined up at your door, waiting for you to open up for the day <laughs> so that they can get air tracking. I like that, that image as well, because it, it gives me this picture of, we've all been in a coffee shop lineup. And you're like, man, this, this lineup happened today and it happened yesterday and the day before and the day before, like every single day, there's people that wake up all over the world and go order a cup of coffee. Like that's probably not going to change. And yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think you folks are in a good place. Maybe I should invest. Let, let, let me in. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, speaking of ever since, ever since, uh, J uh Jason Fried at last microconf, um, was talking about, uh, you know, We've been dropping subtle hints to Jeff Bezos yeah. or, um, you know, other, other Jeffs, other Jeffs out there. Maybe you're our Jeff, but, um, you know, if, if anyone wants to take some money off the table for us with, with no strings attached, so we, you yes. know, we can kind of just pad our bank accounts. So we, so we eliminate some of that risk. We're all ears. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're open. Yeah. yeah. That, that doesn't seem to happen very often, does it? <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, Justin, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, sorry, I yeah. hope we didn't go too long. We're, no, no, we're at one hour. No, I think it's one good. hour and two and uh, two minutes twenty three seconds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, this sorry. was, and, no, this was great. Lots of good stuff. I'm, thanks for being here. I mean, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for taking the time. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here too. <laughs> cool. So, um, I think we need to we need to ask our uh, our founder quest listeners to uh, you know if you like this episode or you like founder quest or if you like justin then go and rate <laughs> if you like justin go on itunes or or wherever you're podcasting uh, wherever you listen and rate us nicely uh, or leave a nice review yes and of course and, you know, um, check out transistor <laughs> fm where we host founder quest because it please. is awesome just like justin is awesome yeah please start your own podcast if you're if you're running starting a bootstrap company uh start a, start your own podcast and use transistor to do it yeah there's so many other founder things you could add like founder adventure founder journey founder <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just take that you could uh, you could just if you if you want to just do a generator in you know in the app you can just uh, like generate your name and founder whatever exactly <laughs> yeah. shepherd you know. founder yeah. Yeah. roll the dice <laughs> <laughs> Lots of options. <laughs> Founder surfer. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Justin. And uh, yeah, we'll link we'll link you up and everything else in the show notes. And uh, yeah, it's been great chatting. Beauty. Thanks. Cool. Catch you later. All right. ThunderQuest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360-degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word. You can access our huge back catalog or sign up for our newsletter to get exclusive VIP content. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.